Hello and welcome to a very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. Um, today we're going to be doing something a little bit different because we have someone here sat in the room who has experience in the role, but now has transitioned to researching about the role. So, Anthony, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Tom. Anthony currently works for Forrester, who produce thought leadership in various different industries, but Anthony specializes in sales operations as he has a background in that previous to joining Forrester. So we're not going to go through the normal eight questions because there are some trends we would like to discuss. So we have six of them, we're going to move through them, um, and hopefully this is going to be maybe less practical, but more insightful and maybe even inspirational. Inspirational <laughs> indeed, yeah. Um, so before we do jump into the trends, can you just Give us a bit of background of your sales ops experience so we know, so you have credibility sure. in, in the conversation. Yeah, so I spent the last five years as a global head of sales operations for our global services company. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a worldwide company. I was based in Dublin managing a, a virtual global sales operations team. So all of the challenges that I think, you know, when I look through some of the, the previous uh, sessions that you've done with other sales operations leaders, very typical, very, uh, you know, sort of things I experienced myself, right? Whether it's how do I evolve a sales operations organization, how do I solve planning challenges, compensation challenges, whatever it might be. And as part of that, I came into the role from a business analytics background and I didn't have really a huge amount of knowledge about sales operations mm -hmm. itself. And so one of the first things I did was ask my manager for some external support. And um, it wasn't going to be realistic for me to be able to bring in a consulting company uh, to bring Anthony up to speed on the whole sales <laughs> operations yeah. thing. But what was uh, an option, uh, uh, Serious Decisions, which is a product line now of Forrester, uh, reached out to me and um, you know suggested their 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 program, which is that you uh, subscribe to their service and you get ongoing access to their analyst team and to their research. And for me, coming into sales operations, that was really helpful because it, it gave me an ongoing path uh, to kind of learn the role, learn the issues involved, and have access to people who could guide me through that process. Because as a sales operations leader, you're asked to make some big decisions that you know have expensive implications within an organization. And so having that was a kind of a risk management uh, aspect to it as well as, as a development aspect for me. Um, so I, I did that for a number of years, worked with them, they helped us put in place uh, a lot of the structure that we, we built within the organization. Um, and then last year they asked me to come and, and, and join them. So to, you know, step outside from the day to day and actually look at the sales operations function itself, right? How do we evolve that, that function? How do we make it more strategic? How do we make it more of a business partner to the rest of the organization? Um, and, you know, that was something I was really interested in doing. I like writing. I love doing the research element of it, but the other part of it is the ongoing advisory with clients. So we spend most of our time talking with clients about their sales operations challenges. Yeah, um, and that's really the kind of that's where we get most of our information that we then build into our research. Got it. And just for when you're actually doing the role, what was the approximate size of your sales ops team, the number of reps, and what were you selling? Sure. Yeah, we were selling a range of of globalization services. So everything from translation to software engineering, software testing. So basically we were helping companies take their products into international markets. Yep. Primarily content, software, documentation, uh, but it's European, Asian markets. So there's always an element of translation, software engineering, uh, and other kind of adjustments that you have to make to make that product yep. viable in another market. Right? Um, we have about 250 salespeople. Yep. I mean, a sales operations team that was relatively small. It was about four to five people. Interesting. So I've been trying to nail down like the perfect ratio of ops to reps, and I, I landed on approximately 25, but what we're talking about here is about one to 50. Right? Yeah. Interesting. Not so, ideal. I, I mean, okay. we're definitely under-resourced. Yeah. Right. Um, and so what that meant for me personally was that I was having to, you know, do a lot of the tactical administrative work and try and provide some strategic leadership mm. for sales operations and you know strategic support to the sales leadership as well. Yeah. And it's just really difficult to move at the pace that the organization wants to move at when you don't have that type of resource. Yeah. So it's, I think it's a challenge that a lot of companies face. 
and now you move. I, I, I don't want to say to the dark side. <laughs> So Maybe the bright the side, light side, the light side. side. I mean, when you move into sales, that's the dark side. Yeah, right? exactly. So you move out of the dark side into the light side. And we're going to sort of touch upon six different trends that Anthony actually identified that were the things that are pertinent in the market right now. The first one is actually quite interesting because we came close to renaming this podcast right. after like a month or so because it kept coming up. And that is the notion of a revenue operations team and a sales operations team. So can you explain a little bit more about what that means and why that, why you think that's happening. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So revenue operations is really around this level of alignment, formalized alignment between um, typically sales operations, marketing operations, and customer success operations. Although there are different flavors out there. Mm -hmm. I think you know, one of the things that we see when we talk with clients and we talk generally in the industry is that there's a lot of experimentation going on around the idea of how to align the different components of the revenue engine and so in some situations you'll see sales enablement as part of that picture others it won't be um, you'll see product management having a, a more formal role to play finance as well depending on whether you've got sales operations with with a connection to you know commercial operations business operations but i think it, it, you know at, a, at, a, at an average level you would say sales ops marketing ops customer success ops and really, I think there's a few things that are driving that. Obviously, on, on the external side, in terms of the customer side, the buying scenario has become a lot more complex, right? The, 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 the number of people involved in these decisions, particularly in enterprise and, and, and beyond, means that trying to understand who's involved in that process, uh, what their interactions are, what they need, and their role within the buying group, um, and how we should interact with those is becoming a difficult thing, not just for sales, but for marketing as well. And then even on, on the customer success side, once you've brought in a customer, it's a different set of personas that you're dealing with, right? The people are actually, you know, you need to adopt and use this, this stuff. Um, so keeping track of all of those personas as, and then optimizing the entire thing together is a challenge for a lot of organizations who have kind of relied on a kind of coalition approach up until now, kind of, we let's all ha hold hands and let's hope this thing comes together. And a lot of times that's dependent on the relationships of the senior level in the organization, right? So does the CMO or the CSO have a positive relationship? And, and sometimes they do and, and things work out well and sometimes they don't. Or somebody leaves and somebody else comes in and has a completely different vision of what sales and marketing should or shouldn't be and things change. So that there isn't that uh, consistency in terms of, of um, how to manage or optimize that revenue engine. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, internally, I think organizations, particularly CEOs and boards, have maybe had enough of the lack of alignment, right? Yeah, you know, whether you're a startup organization and you're, you've got venture capital money um, that's putting pressure on everybody to deliver results, or whether you're a mature organization who maybe the growth is not what it was, you're trying to extend the product life cycles, you're trying to introduce new products, and you know, you've got a very large and complex organization, that there's not a lot of uh, patience for sales and marketing not getting along anymore, right? And then you add into that then the shift between perpetual to subscription business models, you throw in AI. So there's, there's plenty of reasons as to why this, this type of thing needs to happen and why organizations are trying to figure out what's the best model for them. Right. So if you took a company, let's just take Esther for example, where there's five in marketing, five in sales, five in customer success, we don't really have a formal sales operations role, would you recommend that the first ops person we hire over those teams to be someone to sit over everybody or just to focus on sales? Yeah, I mean, I think at, at an early stage of, of an organization, it is a good opportunity to think about revenue operations as opposed to sales operations. Finding a candidate who could do that comfortably is probably the next challenge, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that may be something that's doable in terms of finding that type of mix. Today, I'm not sure that there is a huge volume of people who can comfortably sit across the two. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, there's a question of scale then as well, right? So typically, I think we, we see it happening where They've built out somewhat of a team of a sales ops team, somewhat of a marketing ops team, mm -hmm. and it's a question of okay, how do we get these two, you know, really effectively working right. together? Yeah. Um, but yeah, at those early stages, I think 
it's probably unlikely that you're going to find a profile that, that, that fits, unfortunately. Final question before we move on. Should we rename the podcast? Uh, I think, you know, it, it's one where you're going to have to keep an eye on, on that, right? Because I, I think there's a lot of change happening around this. You know, our organizations are looking to make that shift. Uh, and I think in the next couple of months, you'll probably see more of a, uh, a shift, around, a the shift around the operations. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's certainly a big area of focus for us because clients are coming to us and, and asking us, what is the right model, right? Because CMOs are worried that they, I, I don't want to report to the CRO, right? Uh, you know, I'm a CMO, I, I, I report to the CEO. So you put somebody else in there for me. And you know, within organi other organizations who are very large, there's a huge complexity in building a formalized or centralized revenue operations function. So I think you're going to see a spectrum of mm -hmm. approaches um, across you know companies that are in different life cycle stages. So there's a, you know certainly in, in the analysis and research that we've done, there's a lot of different experimentation mm -hmm. going on. Our job really is to understand what those experiments are, what the pros and cons are of those different choices, and kind of make that available to people so that they can kind of decide what makes sense for them. Got it, yeah. um, moving on to something that I also found quite interesting is what you're saying, or your point about leads versus opportunities. Yeah. Now, as you mentioned, so many buyer personas, should we really be focusing on leads when someone could come in, but you then have seven more people to convince to buy? I, I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so could you share more about that? Yeah, so I, I think generally um, marketing and sales have been very heavily inquiry centric. Right? And we tend to, when somebody raises a hand, it's like everybody focus on this guy, <laughs> right? And we, we just go all in on that. Um, and we don't, we're kind of ignoring the fact that modern B2B buying is more comprehensive than that on the buyer side, right? There's more people involved. And I guess what we're trying to uh, communicate is that the lead object in CRM systems is not the ideal object for capturing that richness because you can only, it only mm -hmm. captures one, it's built for one person, yeah. right? And uh, there's an opportunity, we think, to uh, rethink that model. And so we obviously have a demand unit model that, that talks about the buying unit, and tracking the buying unit, how do we identify who's involved, what their interactions are, how do we provide that as a package to a salesperson so that when they look at an opportunity for marketing that has that information in terms of the multiple uh, personas involved, their activity, it looks like a far more richer opportunity for them to go work yeah. than maybe something that's just one well, individual um, and doesn't have that kind of richness. You know, so it's it's really a, it's a it's a considerable mental shift though as well, right? In terms of because traditionally opportunities have been the domain of the sales organization, right? Sales ops create uh, salespeople create their own opportunities. And I guess what we're saying is it's time to maybe revisit that yeah. and think about. Is there, you know, should one part of the organization own opportunity creation? Is there the opportunity, uh, pardon the pun, to start that process earlier in, in, in the sales cycle? You know, and, and for some organizations, they may start it at uh, SDRs, in terms of SDRs creating the opportunity and passing it along. Others are looking to do it much earlier in the process. So they're doing account-based marketing planning and they're identifying those kind of ideal opportunities and uh, creating them and then as they go through their nurture plans and their campaigns they're adding in the names they're adding in the activity um, and it's working its way then through through the phone so by the time it gets to the sales they've got something that's kind of really yeah. easy right so bringing the opportunity creation further back through the funnel is it are you, are you actually seeing people doing that or are you just think you think that no, no, we're, we're seeing people do that yeah and it's i mean it is a, a shift right and you, you there's a lot of work to be done to get everybody aligned around that idea particularly sales right <laughs> but i think from a marketing perspective they want to be able to deliver greater value to the sales organization right they want to have greater return on investment in, in their campaigns and their other activities but that's where that revenue ops mindset that that alignment mindset is really required to make those type of changes happen um, and the organizations that, that we've worked with who have put that in place, that's kind of been the prerequisite. But right? you can't do that type of stuff if you don't have that buy-in you know, across the, the, the functional leaders. Agile in sales. Yeah, so I, I think it's connected to revenue operations in, in, in a lot of ways. I mean, if companies decide that they want to take a 
a centralized approach to revenue operations, yeah. then that's fine. Then you've got authority across all of the, the, the parts of the revenue engine. Mm -hmm. But when you're relying on a co kind of coalition approach, you don't have a formal authority of marketing or customer success or, or sales and whatever the, the situation might be. So what is your governance model? You know, how do you get these groups to work together? Mm -hmm. And so I think that the question that, that, that we've been looking at is, is Agile and, and in particular things like Scrum a, a governance model that companies can apply when they don't have formal authority, right? So how do you bring um, resources from sales, marketing, and customer success, and product or wherever else together to solve specific challenges within your revenue engine, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's renewals, whether it's a focus on um, you know driving new business logos, but having a, a model to gel everybody together and a way to do it iteratively, right? So it's because a, a lot of the, the initiatives that we see organizations driving they last for a very long time. They're kind of these monster initiatives. They move very slowly. It's very hard to get buy-in, and they don't show results for quite a long time. And the whole you know concept of agile is that you're delivering things along the way. You're showing value along the way. You're getting buy-in as you do that. Um, and also, it's about how do you empower folks in marketing and, and sales ops and elsewhere to be able to have some control over this stuff. Right? And, that means them being able to, you know, if they need the, to pull the and on cord, right? Um, like at the Toyota plants, that the senior guys have to, like one of our, our clients, they ha literally have a, you know, a metaphorical and on cord. So if there's something broken in, broken in, the, in, the, in the sales cycle in the phone, they pull it and the CEO, CMO, the CSO have to sit down within 24 hours to resolve really? it. Right? Wow. Yeah. And so, that type of thing is it's not easy to just you know flick a switch and put that type of infrastructure in place mm -hmm. and in, in some organizations your your devops teams it may already have some form of scrum in mm -hmm. place and scrum expertise within the organization and if you have that then you're kind of at an advantage in terms of being able to think about uh, applying that in marketing and sales if you're doing it from scratch um you've got to invest in bringing somebody to that level who, who could actually instigate that within yeah. our organization. But you know, we're, we're definitely seeing a trend for more and more organizations looking to figure out how to, to apply that and get faster return. Got it, so instead of having like rigid structures within those three areas, success, marketing, and sales, you actually think under a CRO, there could be dynamic groups working together to achieve things faster. Correct, and, and not even under a CRO. You know, if the company decides that they don't want to make any functional organizational design changes, so it, you know, you still have a CMO, still have a CSO, still have a chief customer officer, whatever, but you, know, you want to get these teams working together tightly and effectively, that's certainly a, you know, a very strong option for doing that. Got it. Um, fourth trend, moving on to AI in sales. Yeah. So what do we, how, what examples are you seeing today of AI being used to improve the sales process? So I think like the, the obvious first wave of AI within sales has been a productivity play, mm -hmm. right? How do we give our salespeople back more time to sell? How do we improve the quality of the information that we get from our salespeople? And so a lot of the AI um, tooling uh, and certainly first wave has been around taking the administration burden off the salespeople, capturing, you know, call details, emails, contact data, um, and, you know, improving the quality of that information. Because salespeople don't like doing it, right? No, nobody wants to, to do that stuff within sales. So, I mean, AI has, has largely solved that problem for the companies who can afford to do it, right? And that's probably another challenge, right? But, um, so now that you've, you've started to capture that data, AI is starting to do some other things. It's starting to be able to give you back and give sellers back information. So it's tracking things like, well, you know, to our, our, just our previous discussion around buying groups, who is involved in, in, the, in the buying group? Um, what interactions are they having uh, either digitally or, or with, you know, salespeople, with marketing, whoever? What results are you seeing from those different types of interactions? 
um, and giving people back recommended next steps in terms of what should you be doing next uh, uh, in this stage of the sales process or in this stage of the, the, the marketing funnel or what type of content should you be sharing next you know, that works for this particular type of buying persona. And then I think for, for a lot of organizations, particularly in marketing as well, they've lost a lot of their contact uh, database through GDPR. And um, a lot of AI tools are now are able to plumb the, the, uh, the seller's email inboxes and other areas where they do all of their shadow pipeline, shall we say, mm. and, uh, and bring that stuff up to the surface, right? Because probably on average, the salesperson is putting about 20% of the, the contacts that they have into the CRM, yeah. right? And so AI is, is pulling that stuff out and serving it up. And so there is a bit of a trade-off within the organization that, you know, I think companies have to think about as well is that they're, one play of, of AI is that they're getting productivity, you're taking this administration burden off them, but the, the, the trade-off is that there's a much larger increase in transparency. Right? Yeah. And so, you know, the, for, for organizations have to think about culturally how they sell that within their sales organization. Right? This, so, I have to actually have a product client does this, right? right? And so our challenge, if we're trying to sell to your sales manager or sales operations person, if, like, the, the, the challenge is not selling to them, the challenge is them selling to their reps, yeah. right? And we've, somebody else have not, we've lost because reps have pushed back and don't want full transparency. Yeah. Um, so that's a super interesting challenge to have. Yeah, and I, and I think part of it is setting the expectations up early. You know, we, we've seen some examples where clients have put in place systems, have not had the engagement with the, with the sales staff, and that's, you know, they haven't been upfront about mm -hmm. the fact that they're, they're putting these tools in place and with good reason, right? We, you know, a company has to have transparency into, into in the same way as Uber has trans transparency into all of its drivers mm -hmm. and what they what they do. A sales organization needs to, to have that same type of visibility, but it has to come with a, an understanding that it's not just there to pick one salesperson off against the other, you know, that, that it, it's for more progressive reasons, right? Um, in terms of giving sellers recommendations, making sure they're working on the right deals, um, and that you know that their their chances of moving an opportunity from one stage to the next improves as a result of this data. Right? So it's serving them. I think part of the problem in the past is that a lot of these tools have been put in place, and the beneficiaries of of it were really sales operations or sales leadership or executive leadership. But I think more and more AI is serving back important content to the sellers mm -hmm. to help them Got move it. deals on. Right? Yeah. So, uh, like, I get it. So, previously, AI was just serving the overlords. Now, AI is developing such that it's also <laughs> serving the reps, the actual reps themselves. Yeah, yeah. And therefore, they would have less pushback on any of these tools because it's actually adding value to their commission check. Yeah. I mean, I think, it, obviously, there's a, there's a change management effort there that you have to consider as well, right? How do we deal with, with sellers' concerns? How do we uh, pilot these type of approaches where we you know, we get to show sellers in a smaller scale of world the value of what they're getting from these tools? Um, and uh, you know, before you, you go you know, with, the, with, a, with a big push, that will certainly be our recommendation. Got it. Um, analytics in sales. Now, I assume, or what I've seen in the last like 10 years is the amount of data available to somebody running a sales process has probably like grown exponentially. That's getting, so, getting worse. Yeah, exactly. for real. And so that means we now have a problem of what do we do with all this information? Correct. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think not only is there more data, there's more ways of analyzing the data, there's more tools. You know, uh, pretty much an eight-year-old can create a dashboard at this point. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's no shortage of dashboards and reports anymore, right? But the challenge is, are we delivering insights? Are we really being influential in terms of what we bring to senior leadership, to executive leadership? Um, are we telling a story with the data? Because I think for a lot of analysts, they're relying on, on the data to do the, the, the hard work for them, right? And you, know, you have to do, there has to be an element of translation, right? We, we take all this data, we get a sense of what the insights are from these, but what, what are we looking for in terms of action? What's the recommendation that we're looking to bring to, to senior leadership? What's the evidence that supports that? Um, 
and you know it's so it's it's not just enough to be a data cruncher anymore because you know anybody can be a data cruncher these days now obviously there's complexities right yeah. but you know within sales operations um, a lot of the metrics are defined at this point in terms of what are the standard metrics for measuring effective performance. So creating dashboards around those is uh, becoming less and less of a challenge. Um, obviously, companies still have a lot of extraneous data that they're trying to you know, pull together and, and build into this stuff. But ultimately, if you're trying to influence and persuade senior leadership, you've got to have the ability to translate that stuff into action. You know? Yeah. And I think that's where we see a lot of companies struggling with, right? And they're, they're trying to think of, okay, do I need to hire a data scientist? Do I need to, what kind of analyst profile do I need? And so I think what we're, we're trying to encourage them is to make sure that they don't ignore that ability to translate data and insights into actions and be persuasive in right. front of senior leadership, right? It's almost like if, if, you know, if you didn't have a dashboard or you didn't have reports and you were sat down with a senior executive, mm -hmm. That you could tell that story in 60 seconds. Yeah. And if you can't, it's probably time to go back to the dashboard uh -huh. and redo it again. You know? Interesting. So this, you're saying that the skill that we now need is the more emotional ability to take this information but then explain what we should do about it in a, in a compelling way. Yeah, exactly. I, I, emotion is the, is the right word, right? We're looking to elicit emotion from senior leadership, right? Um, and sometimes that's not hard, but sometimes it is, particularly in terms of the things that within sales operations we care about, right? Things that we are looking to try and uh, drive change within the organization. Some of it may relate to investment within sales operations itself, ah, right? Yes, of course. Yeah. And so I think a, a large um, requirement of, of an effective sales operations leader is their ability to influence leadership in the organization to get the budget you need for more resources, investment, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And finally, um, in a related point, I guess, tech stack, well, like prioritization of tools, the amount of tools we have now and budget, Yeah, you're, you're seeing some kind of, well, I guess, more tools, same amount of budget, is that a challenge? It, yeah, I, mean, I, I think what I see is obviously you know, we, we deal with a, a broad range of, of customers, yeah. uh, you know, early stage, mid stage yeah. uh, uh, and beyond, and they all have to pay the CRM mortgage, right? <laughs> like before you can feed the kids yeah. and you know dress them, you've got to you've got to pay the mortgage, and um, it's substantial. Right? And I think for 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 you know to that topic we were just talking about in terms of persuasion and, and and you know getting greater investment, it's a tough one because there are an increasing set of tools now to wrap around the sales organization that are really kind of transformative, right? And you guys are part of that. Um, but for, for a lot of organizations that we speak to, they're, they're struggling to get the additional investment required to actually bring this stuff to life within yeah. their own organization. Um, and I think that's going to be an increasing source of frustration as to how, you know, are they getting enough value from their CRM systems? Um, and what can they do about that? Because, you know, every year, if, like, if you take an, an average organization, 250 salespeople like I had, I don't know what the average is these days, but it's probably close to half a million dollars, right? Every year. So the FD is seeing the Salesforce invoice and then it is trying to justify the ROI. And then you're coming and being like, hey, I, I want to do this, or I'll just create something. And they're like, you know. Yeah. So I, I think that's, a, that's a, a challenge, but I think to deal with that, companies have to really look at their technology strategy for sales operations. What are the investments that could make a significant difference, particularly in terms of product, seller productivity, right? Um, that's a very obvious place to start, right? And, um, you know, because anytime you can give sellers more time in front of customers to go prospect, to meet, that's that's a, that's definitely the right thing to do. And there's, there's very different ways to do it across the industry, but taking a hard look as to um, how could you, you drive improvements around that how could you give them back that, that time? That's definitely a good place to start. Got it. And a question I want to finish with is the question we finish every interview with is who in the world of sales operations has given you the most knowledge? Who's been your inspiration? Yeah, it's pretty easy one. It's my, my boss. Uh, that's going to sound really <laughs> easy, right? Well, I, my, I yeah, was watching. yeah, Dana Terry is, is uh, the practice leader for, for sales operations. And I say that because 
uh, he was my uh, a mentor really as in this role as I joined it in last year, but mm -hmm. previously as a client, right? Yeah. So he's somebody that that kind of has guided me through this sales operations journey that I think a lot of the folks you know who, who watch this uh, podcast are on as well. So having that person who can kind of give you an understanding of, of how to evolve your career in sales operations. What are the issues? What are the different perspectives on it? Because as you move from one organization to another, or you move from one transition to another, as an organization matures, things change, priorities change, and you know what worked in a previous company, what worked in a previous days, is not necessarily what's going to work this time. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I think he's been really kind of a, a mentor for me. So that's. Uh, yeah, there we are. Yeah. Um, awesome. The no. check is in the post. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I always try to summarize with like the insights I really thought were interesting, but there's probably too many in this problem. Um, the ones that stick in my mind there are there how easy it is to like visualize data, and that's now not the problem anymore. Mm -hmm. The problem is trying to emotionally influence people with a story. Yeah. Um, having teams work within a revenue operation in an agile fashion, I think it's really progressive and really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to see, maybe we will link to some of your research somewhere on the webpage. Sure. Um, if we have any case studies or examples there, so that's super interesting. And the final one is the CRM mortgage. <laughs> and how the, chat, the real challenge in, in getting investment for other tools um, if you're not able to fully like utilize or prove that the value. Um, so we will link to Forrester and Anthony on LinkedIn somewhere around this video and more audio. Um, so if you do have any questions, I'm sure you can reach out and then obviously pretend to work with Forrester sure. if there's a need. Um, but that was super insightful. Thank you so much for your time. No problem. Pleasure.